we're going to be talking about this cluster of uh, sort of um, words that we inquire about, strategy, policy, governance, sometimes we say cooperation. Uh, but I want to first explain my preferred term, which is governance. Uh, some people, when they hear governance, they think regulation. Governance is not just regulation. In fact, regulation might be a very small part of governance. Some people hear, when they hear global governance, they think world government. Uh, that is also not, uh, does not follow. Rather, the term governance just refers to the whole mess of processes by which decisions are made. Uh, and so that includes laws, regulations, policies, but also institutions and norms. <clears throat> So we can begin, begin provocatively uh, with what we might call one theory of uh, AI-enabled governance, uh, which is from Vladimir Putin. Whoever leads an AI will rule the world. Right, so this is, if you will, a theory of governance because it says how decisions will be made under an AI-enabled uh, future. Um, now, uh, before proceeding, it's worth remarking that Putin was not staring ominously into the camera when he said it. Um, he was, in fact, encouraging Russian school children to do their science projects on robotics and other topics. But this quote really did resonate around the world because I think it tapped into a fear uh, that many people have um, that the sort of governance of all things of the world uh, could be dramatically changed by AI, that power could shift, uh, world order could change. Um, so that's why the question of the governance of AI, how decisions about AI will be made, are so important. This leads to the normative definition, which is that we don't just want to think about what the processes are, we want good processes. And by good, we mean something like effective, legitimate, inclusive, adaptive. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of things. Uh, it will not feel um, like I've covered the whole space, and that's because I will have not done so. And the reason uh, that that is the case is because this problem is really hard. The governance of AI will not be easy. Uh, we can see this by thinking about the nature of AI as a general purpose technology, like electricity, the printing press, the combustion engine. Uh, these general purpose technologies transform society, the economy, military, in a deep fundamental way that's often hard to anticipate and very hard to govern. Um, so on the right-hand side, I list some of the properties that are plausibly the case with AI, and each of these makes it difficult to govern. The fact that the, the benefits and the harms are so diffuse makes it hard for political groups to mobilize together to address those harms and to realize those benefits. The great uncertainty we have about what kinds of capabilities are coming and what the implications of those capabilities will be makes it, again, very hard to build uh, appropriate norms and regulations around it, and so on with the rest of these uh, properties. To try to make sense of this, at the Center for Governance of AI at the Future of Humanity Institute, we have been uh, beginning work on a whole host of questions, and part of that work has led to this uh, research agenda, where we try to articulate uh, the main questions and, and tractable ways into the problem. Uh, and this research agenda breaks the space up into four categories the technical landscape, politics, ideal governance, and then policy. These four categories uh, share a mapping with the conference organization, so ideal governance is like the destination, right? It's where we want to get to. If we could all sit around the table and discuss calmly and rationally, what would we come up with? Politics refers to uh, you know, the fact that it won't be a calm, rational, patient conversation around the table. Uh, there will be interest groups, there will be misunderstandings, there will be coalitions. Uh, there will be institutions with voting rules of different kinds, and that will shape what world we find ourselves in. So we want to understand those political dynamics. The technical landscape refers to what are the sort of technical constraints and possibilities uh, made possible by AI and other um, technologies. Uh, and then finally, policy refers to the lessons we draw from this for what we should be doing tomorrow. What kinds of near-term steps can we take to steer us towards beneficial AI, or AGI? Um, an analogy might help. Suppose we are founding a city. Uh, the technical landscape is the geographic landscape and perhaps the relative price of steel and aluminum and uh, concrete. The politics is, again, the interest groups, the values of, of different parties, the coalitions, the voting rules. Ideal governance are the blueprints we come together and articulate for what the city could look like. And then policy is what we're going to do tomorrow to make that happen. I want to begin by distinguishing between two kinds of conservatism uh, that I think scientists especially uh, it's helpful to distinguish for them. Uh, and I'll illustrate that with a quote from Leo Zillard, uh, the inventor of the neutron chain reaction. From the very beginning, the line was drawn. Fermi thought that the conservative thing was to play down his 10% possibility that a nuclear chain reaction may happen, while Zillard thought the conservative thing was to assume that it would happen and take all the necessary precautions. So as scientists, we don't want to make claims, statements that we can't support right, with theory and evidence. And that's a good virtue for scientific discourse. 
But for policymakers, we want to take low probability, high impact possibilities seriously. Because if we don't, some of them will be realized and we won't be prepared. And so it's good to separate while as scientists we want to be uh, you know, calm and epistemically grounded when thinking about extreme possibilities from AI. As policymakers, we want to allow ourselves uh, the imagination to think what could come in 5, 10, 15 years uh, so we can prepare ourselves for it. <clears throat> so first I'll tell you a little bit about the technical landscape, but again, I'm just going to dip into it, giving you some examples of research we've been doing. Um, so uh, there's a lot of questions in this space. Uh, we might ask, for example, what are the kinds of powerful AI systems that could emerge in the coming years? What are their strategic properties? Are they, say, offense biased or defense biased? Uh, do they lend themselves towards cooperation? Or do they increase uncertainty and stochasticity and, say, power? Where are the inputs and capabilities in the world and how are they changing? Inputs like compute, training data, uh, talent. Can we model a progress, AI progress, so we can better anticipate uh, what, uh, in five or 10 years, uh, the landscape will look like? Who will be the most uh, prominent actors? Can we forecast capabilities? So some of the work that we might call mapping was done by Nick Bostrom in Superintelligence, looking out into the future, trying to see what different uh, advanced capabilities would look like and what the implications are. Some other mapping work is done by Jeffrey Ding uh, in his report, Deciphering China's AI Dream, uh, looking at what the current capabilities are in China for various kinds of AI and trying to forecast how that could change into the future, as well as what uh, the constellation of actors in China uh, produce in terms of um, goals uh, for the country. Some other work is done by Ben Garfinkel, looking at cryptographic, cryptographic systems, and we might simplify that and say blockchain, uh, could do for global coordination, global order, world order. And I highly recommend this report uh, as uh, among the best analyses I've seen of what um, these really exciting technologies, but also um, ultimately, in many ways, limited technologies uh, really do enable. Some other work uh, with, that Ben has done is looking at how the offense-defense balance will change as the amount of resources spent by actors increases. Uh, and this is relevant to AI because if AI scales up the resources available, say for autonomous weapons, for cyber warfare, uh, then it could change the character of conflict. And this really interesting result we found was that for a number of different kinds of conflict domains, as resources scale up, the offense-defense balance scales towards the defensive. It doesn't go all the way necessarily to defense dominance, but it does become more defense biased. And there's a number of other interesting questions, again, related to the strategic properties of advanced AI. <clears throat> Some other work is surveying AI researchers at NeurIPS and ICML and others to try to get some data on what the future might look like. Uh, now, of course, you shouldn't take these um, uh, survey results as especially sort of, it's not from an oracle that knows the future, but it is one source of data, and then we want to complement that with other kinds of um, data to try to get timelines. I want to use this visual metaphor to clarify how we can think about AGI and, and how we can think about our work and governance related to it. So imagine, uh, so the, the, cap the capability space or the task space is high dimensional, right? 10 to the 10 to the 100, Anthony suggested yesterday. Um, this, I can only represent two dimensions on this screen, so let's collapse it to two dimensions. Uh, say, physics research and understanding humans. AGI is not a point in this space, which some people might you might think, because it's a word, it suggests it's a single thing. AGI is sort of right here uh, when you get to human level on all capabilities. Rather, AGI is a cloud or a, you know, a space, the northeast quadrant above uh, this intersection. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing that is that AGI is not one thing. It's, it's a huge space of possible kinds of technology. Um, AI systems right at that intersection look very different from AI systems up here or over here. Uh, so that, again, is, is just a reminder that when we say AGI, we're not describing a, a particular system. We have a clear a vision in mind. Now, there's this other concept of transformative AI, uh, which has different definitions depending on who's using it. Uh, I might use it to, to um, mean when an AI system that could radically change uh, wealth, power, or world order. So when would we see transformative AI? We might graph it like this and everything, again, northeast of that. Uh, and I think that's plausible because once we have actual AGI systems, in this kind of simplest sense, that's very likely to be extremely transformative. But probably the transformative implications will come sooner, right? And this suggests that we might want to start from the present, that we understand relatively well, and then try to extrapolate out under different pathways to the points where we see extreme transformative possibilities arising. And that's what I'll describe 
uh, now under the politics section. So this is the big slide of some political challenges from near-term AI. And again, I'm just focusing on near-term AI because they're easier to see, uh, but it's under this logic that if we can see them and understand them well, we can extrapolate out to when transformative possibilities start hitting and towards the implications of AGI. Uh, and there's really each of these uh, items we could talk about for an hour or a day or a whole conference. Um, so I'll just talk about a few. Uh, one that we will be having a panel on is uh, labor displacement and inequality. That's clearly a very big issue uh, that already many people in the world are concerned about. And AI and automation could dramatically uh, amplify and exacerbate uh, those concerns. Um, there's concerns about influence, right? If algorithms are ever more sophisticated at understanding our psychology and inferring our psychology from, say, the digital traces we leave on Facebook and, and other uh, online um, sites, then what does that mean for, the, say, the balance of power between uh, marketers and uh, citizen, or consumers or between governments and citizens? Another political challenge that I want to emphasize, uh, because most of these are sort of gloomy or are, um, suggest AI is disruptive, is uh, that we might lose the innovation and the progress that we're seeing in AI if there's a fearful backlash. So if trust in AI developers and in governments that are uh, sort of sponsoring that is lost, we could see a backlash and clumsy policy that follows. And I'll share with you um, some survey results that are going public at the end of this conference uh, that speak to this. So this was a survey of Americans. Uh, and one of the questions we asked was to what extent they trust various actors to develop or manage AI in the interests of the public. And some takeaways are you're more likely to be trusted if you are the US military or if you're academic university researchers or scientists. You're moderately trusted if you're a technology company, unless your name is Facebook. <laughs> and interestingly, this survey was actually done before the Cambridge Analytica scandal uh, exploded. So this uh, a loss of trust uh, had been accumulating. Um, you're moderately trusted if you're an intelligence agency within the US government, but you are not trusted if you're the federal government or state government or the UN. So this tells us something about at least Americans' perspectives, and we'll be surveying Europeans uh, and Chinese citizens uh, going forward to understand how people think about uh, uh, the governance of AI. <clears throat> Another interesting set of results we found relates to the demographics of support for developing AI and HLMI, which here you can think of it as almost AGI. Uh, but before showing you the results, I want to have you all sort of articulate your prior about the results. So first, on gender, do you think men uh, are more supportive of AI and HLMI or women? So everyone, d decide in your head, and then I'll have you raise your hands. OK, so if you think men are more supportive of a developing AI and HLMI, raise your hands. OK, and if you think women are more supportive, raise your hands. So strongly leaning towards men, but some uh, thinking women. And how about education? Do you think more educated people are more supportive of AI and HLMI or less educated people? So uh, raise your hands if you think more educated people are more supportive. OK, and less educated. Great, so I'm very happy that the room was, didn't have consensus, uh, because then I can say that there's value in the science that I'm about to present. <clears throat> so we will learn something. Uh, so the answer is the sort of prototypical person who uh, is more opposed to AI is female, less educated, poor, and without computer science uh, uh, background or experience. Um, and interestingly, this is for both AI and, and HLMI. <clears throat> it correlates pretty strongly. Um, some other less strong results related to religion um, and uh, political partisanship, for example. So this is one issue that hasn't uh, broken yet on partisan grounds, though it might. Um, speaking to uh, a point Max made this morning, uh, if we ask them about how sort of hopeful they are uh, about HLMI, in this case we ask them for the expected impact of HLMI, um, you'll see 12% chose extremely bad, possibly human extinction. Um, that's more, more than double the proportion that said extremely good. So, and then also on balance bad outweighs ever so slightly on balance good. So Americans at least are not thinking that AGI is going to bring utopia, or they're not convinced of that. Um, and this is important for a few reasons. One, these might be legitimate concerns that uh, it would be good to address. Uh, but two, this level of um, sort of negative expectation about the, what AGI means for, for them and for uh, humanity uh, could again lead to that backlash, could lead to um, resistance to all the possibilities and the upside that we see. So I think this is something we should 
uh, you know, be taken very seriously. <clears throat> okay, so there's a number of other issues. Again, I'm just gonna jump in. Uh, a report uh, from early 2018 was the malicious use of AI report, which uh, many of you may have seen, looking at the many ways that AI enables new sort of malicious actions. Um, again, it's not to say that AI is net negative, but it's worth uh, being attentive to those possibilities. Another new paper uh, by Nick Bostrom is the vulnerable world hypothesis, which asks if technology becomes especially destructive, so if one person could cause a lot of harm because, uh, enabled by new technology, what does that mean for world order and for sort of the ideal governance? <clears throat> Among these many issues, I think there's an underlying issue which I and others focus on, which is competition between firms, countries, and especially great power security competition. I see this as an amplifier and something that exacerbates many of these other issues. And even issues like privacy, which you might think is an issue that uh, a country can figure out for itself, right? A country, sh a well-governed country, say Sweden, should be able to uh, formulate its own optimal policies with respect to privacy. Um, but competition puts constraints, or at least it, it, it uh, forces on them trade-offs that they might not want to make. Uh, for example, the EU uh, might want to have stronger privacy legislation, but if they do that, they're worried that they will have difficulties cultivating new AI companies and AI champions. So now they face this trade-off between economic uh, prosperity and their sort of preferred uh, values in how algorithms are deployed. And this, I think, applies to almost all of these issues, that competition between countries, uh, and especially competition that touches on security, national security concerns, makes it much harder to solve these problems. I want to also um, complicate uh, two metaphors that we often use for understanding risks from AI. So we often talk about them as coming from accidents or coming from misuse, right? So an accident is something that arises because the engineers weren't careful enough or they didn't spend enough time looking at the system or maybe the science was insufficiently developed or maybe the, the, the machinery is, is very complicated and so it's accident prone. Whereas misuse is the kind of harm that comes from some malicious actor, usually a rogue actor, a terrorist, a criminal, uh, who gets their hands on the technology and then deploys it in a way that's against society's preferences. These two perspectives are really useful, but they're incomplete. And in fact, I think they miss a lot of the variation in where risk comes from, and also a lot of the opportunities for policy intervention. So Remco and I suggest a structural perspective, which focuses on these various structural properties of society, politics, the economy, uh, that are more likely to generate risks. And I have here John F. Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, as the sort of exemplary image, because I don't think we would call the Cuban Missile Crisis an accident. Right? It's not that the nuclear weapon systems uh, were poorly built leading to the crisis, nor was it a case of misuse. It wasn't uh, a terrorist or some, a rogue actor outside the sort of legitimate political order uh, that led to the crisis. Rather, it was the legitimate leaders of two great powers who, who found themselves at the brink of nuclear war uh, because of structural strategic properties of the international system. So I think a lot of our thinking has to be uh, much more structural to really grasp where the risks come from. Um, we're looking at uh, the levers of influence that the U.S. government, for example, would have over AI companies in, in the industry and vice versa to try and understand what the strategic game could look like in the future. We're also looking at historical examples of attempts to control powerful technology, like in this case depicted uh, the, um, the conversations after World War II to control nuclear weapons. So many of us uh, weren't aware of this. Uh, there was a serious conversation that took place about the U.S. giving up nuclear weapons to the U.N., uh, in order for there not to be an arms race in nuclear weapons. This conversation did not succeed, uh, but there's a lot of interesting lessons about how that took place, uh, including, number one, that scientists can play an extremely important role uh, politically uh, and also enabling cooperation, such as by finding technical possibilities that would otherwise be overlooked. <clears throat> okay, so moving on to ideal governance. In many ways, this is the work that I think has been least done so far, uh, and I applaud Max for in both his book but also at the two conferences at Silomar and here, uh, really trying to have us articulate what are these positive visions that we can look towards. Um, some work that we've done at FHI is uh, this paper, Policy Desiderata for Superintelligent AI, where we try to articulate what are things that are, what are uh, sort of features that become more important in a world of advanced machine intelligence. Um, some other work is again from the survey that is gonna be public in a few days where we asked Americans, what are the governance challenges that they regarded as most important and most likely? And the takeaways here are one, they regard them all as pretty important. So the, the bottom of this figure is 2.5. That's uh, somewhere between uh, somewhat important and very important. 
Um, and the other takeaway is that there is variation in how uh, Americans perceive these uh, governance challenges. Data privacy, cyber tax, and surveillance uh, stand out as among the more salient to them. And finally, uh, it's good to do this work, this research, uh, but it's even better if we can translate that into policy recommendations for the near term. So I'll tell you about one. Uh, this is called the Windfall Clause. This was first articulated in Nick's uh, book, uh, and the idea is if some actor, some company, wins the AI windfall, wins the AI lottery, right, they become uh, this super corporation uh, with the best AGI that's uh, capturing all the markets, it would be good if they redistributed a lot of that uh, wealth to the world, uh, to humanity. And um, the idea behind this proposal is that it could be a legally uh, um, committing obligation that they would voluntarily undertake uh, now, before, when they're far away from this windfall, to give away the bounty in the event that they happen to win the lottery. And what's really exciting is that uh, legally it seems to be permissible under Delaware law to make this contractual commitment so long as the expected costs at the time of the commitment are less than 10% of national uh, annual taxable income. So the basic idea is as long as the, you're not giving away too much uh, right away and you're not, if the uh, risk is sufficiently high that you're going to win or the probability is sufficiently high or low that you're going to win, uh, then it's tolerable to shareholder, uh, to share value um, and shareholders don't have a legal basis to uh, sue against that. So in summary, there's a lot of important questions and work to be done. Uh, and what, what's great is there's a lot of um, talent that's pouring into this field uh, working on these projects. So I look forward to, in the coming years, uh, working with many of you uh, to answer these questions. Thanks.